Welcome to the Business Podcast, where we interview professionals across all industries. Hey, it's Simon. Welcome back. Today we have Zach Lindquist, Director of Operations for Pure Crypto, a digital asset fund of funds. Zach, it's great to have you here with us today. How are you doing today? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Uh, perhaps you can kick us off and share something about yourself that most people don't know. Yeah, happy to do that. Um, so like you said, I, I work um, in the cryptocurrency ecosystem um, and have quickly, I guess, branded myself as everyone's go-to Bitcoin guy. Um, but something that people don't know as much about me, uh, I would have to say not as many people know that I really enjoy um, grilling. I actually have a smoker grill and I, I love to um, smoke, you know, and barbecue and um, have been doing that for a few years. And I think I'm getting uh, a lot better at it, but it, it's a really um, fun hobby that I enjoy doing. I love all types of food, but, but in particular, I love barbecue. And so um, I've gotten pretty into that over the last few years. And that is great. Have you ever looked into pellet grills? I, yes, I have. So I have a Traeger. I got uh, about three years ago, um, which which um, I've I've used uh, quite a bit. So I've gone through, oh, man, I don't know, hundreds of pounds of pellets over the last three years, smoking briskets, ribs, pork, um, salmon. I mean, I I've kind of tried it all. So you are a very good friend of your friends, given what you're saying right now. I bet you have some really cool social gatherings. Um, yeah, so thanks for sharing that. Uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about your ascent into what you're doing now, a little bit of background, how you started off in your career and, and how you got to where you are now. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I was playing a fifth year uh, a football at Wheaton College, small liberal, liberal arts school here uh, outside of Chicago. And at that time, I was interning downtown uh, Chicago for a firm, uh, CMT Asset Management. I was on the operations team. Um, and that was where I was introduced to Bitcoin and digital assets broadly. And I took, um, I took time on the, on the train to and from uh, this internship to really dig into the nuances of the technology, what was, um, you know, why was this something people were interested in? You know, why did the, why was the price so volatile? Um, it was, it was in the back half of 2017. So this was, um, this Bitcoin and, and digital assets were just, just barely kind of making it onto the, the mainstream um, news outlet radar. And so, I got I got involved and in, you know bought a little bit myself. Tried to keep learning about it. Um, end of 2017, obviously the markets went crazy, um, and ignorantly I kind of thought this thing was never going to go down. It was just going to keep going up forever. Um, so was pretty surprised in 2018 uh, when when everything eventually corrected. But I had actually left that firm and joined Pure Crypto in January of 2018 because I had connected with a uh, with a um, person who my wife actually introduced me to who was launching a uh, fund of funds in the space as sort of a vehicle for their family office clients. Uh, and so we, um, I joined as the uh, director of operations for that fund of funds. And it was really just a, um, I, I was trying to find a job in this space and there really wasn't um, a lot of opportunities around me. And so I was just, you know, I was emailing everyone I could. I emailed Coinbase, I emailed Kraken, I emailed just any any firm that was working in this space. I just wanted to get involved really, really badly. And it just so happened that there was somebody um, who lived less than 10 minutes away from me who needed uh, someone with my, um, with my knowledge base. And so I'm really thankful I got connected to Jeremy who um, was launching this fund. We launched in January of 2018, which um, for those who are familiar with the, with the digital asset market, that was pretty close to the exact top of the market. So 2018 was, uh, 
not a good year for the fund. We obviously, we traded down with the market, um, but just kind of dug our heels in, continue to try to raise capital. Um, you know, I, ha I had a pretty strong conviction that this wasn't going to be something that just blew away overnight. Uh, 2019, uh, a little bit of that excitement returned to the market, but really in 2020 was when this thing um, kind of launched itself back into the mainstream. And uh, the fund did phenomenally in 2019 and in 2020 as well. Um, so now it's, it's a, um, it's a fun thing to talk about. I think people, people ask me a lot of questions and I'm happy to move people along. Um, it's, it's a really, really steep learning curve. So most of my conversations don't even end up with, you know, um, talking about pure crypto or the fund of funds and whether that's a, a fit for that investor, but really I would say 75 to 80% of my conversations are just educational, just trying to um, walk through what this technology is, the problem it's solving, um, and what the investment opportunity is. Thanks for making that distinction around the conversations uh, that you're often having, but but also in sharing your, uh, your ascent in your career. Um, I think it's very timely to be speaking now in... Uh, the end of the first quarter of 2021, entering this new Q2, and uh, and looking at how the blockchain and cryptocurrency is becoming more accepted by the market and more popular. Right. With, with that in mind, uh, perhaps you can share a story in as much detail as you care to share of a big win that you've had within the pure crypto. Yeah. Um, yeah, happy to do that. So uh, as a fund of funds, we don't actually hold any assets directly. So all of our invested capital uh, gets allocated into hedge funds. So we are a hedge fund of hedge funds. Um, and so I can share one major win um, from one of our underlying managers that was you know, then a win for our fund. Uh, so multi-coin capital is one of the larger uh, digital asset hedge funds in the space. And I believe in 2018, it was either in back half of 2018 or 2019, um, they made a seed round investment in a, in a project called The Graph. Uh, the Graph is a, um, it's I'm trying, to, trying to figure out how to best explain this. It, it pulls data from the blockchain. Um, so in order to have a, a functioning DeFi application, a decentralized finance application, like a borrowing and lending protocol, you need something to go and pull data from the blockchain in order to, um, in order for those applications to work. And so the graph kind of fits in between, you know, the smart contract uh, platform and the, and the application layer uh, and just really just provides a way to, um, to pull data from the blockchain. So um, this project was raising their seed round, I think in, in 2019, um, had no idea how the investment would do, but Multicoin had a pretty um, sizable bet. Uh, they had a lot of conviction in this project. And so it actually just came to market at the back half of last year. Uh, so December, um, the, the token, I think, trades on some of the larger exchanges. I think you can buy it on Coinbase. Um, but, you know, our, our fund was one of the original investors in that project. Um, so our cost basis, I think, was at a $10 million valuation. Uh, and now it's trading on multiples of that. And so that's been a huge win for, uh, for the fund. And that's been a project that has just kind of sat um, in, the, in the dark for a few years. We, you know, we didn't, we didn't really have uh, price discovery until that token hit the public markets. Um, and so, you know, today... Um, it trades on Coinbase, like I said, but um, it was a big win for our fund. And so we're really, really excited about um, the other things that are going to eventually turn to the public markets as well. Oh, that's a very interesting story. Uh, on that note, what would you say has been one of the biggest challenges? Yeah, um, definitely 2018 was a, a, a big challenge. Uh, you know, you it's, it's not fun losing money, you know, in a, in a fund you, you're, um, you know, we were down about 60, 65% in 2018. And so obviously there, there was, um, 
concern on my end that that I was going to have to be looking for a new job at some point in the next year. Um, and, you know, joining a, a failed hedge fund isn't a really good career starter. So that was definitely a big challenge in 2018. But but what kind of got us through that um, that time really was uh, the fact that we had marketed this fund correctly. Uh, we had told our investors, uh, this is a two, this is a one to 3% portfolio allocation. Um, it's very risky. It very well could go to zero. You could lose all your money. Um, but it also, it, it could put multiples on your entire portfolio at the same time. So we just thought the risk reward opportunity was attractive. Um, but we, we clearly articulated the risks around losing um, the capital because this is, you know, this is a, experimental asset class uh, these these projects you know, bitcoin's the oldest and it's only 12 years old um so we because we i think marketed the fund correctly we saved ourselves a lot of um a lot of time having having to have conversations with investors who were who were concerned or scared about um where the fund was going and so we actually didn't really have we had one redemption um out of those original 2018 investors out of about you know, 30, 35 investors. So we, we consider that to be a big success, but it obviously was a, was a challenge having to communicate with investors in 2018. Certainly. And uh, the way I articulated it as a small allocation of their total holdings uh, goes to that point of marketing it appropriately because it's uh, a fairly new asset class. Um, what would you say categorizes an ideal investment when your organization is looking at funds to partner with and hold a position? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say an ideal investment, given uh, that the world, I think, is transitioning into the digital age. The, the ideal investment is finding um, is finding projects or, or companies that are achieving uh, network effects. So what I mean by that is, is if you think, to think back to Facebook, right? When you, um, at some point, Facebook got so big, onboarded so many users that um, it was really, really not feasible for anyone to disrupt Facebook. Uh, Facebook was the place where you went to talk with all your friends because they were already there, you know, and, and MySpace hadn't quite achieved that. And I think that's a big reason why Facebook um, was able to steal market share there. And, and it didn't matter if another, if another firm had better technology um, because Facebook had already achieved this network effect of, of adding users um, and, and at some point kind of achieving this like escape velocity of they've added so many users to their product. Um, that that you know the value of their of their company kind of grows exponentially and, and it kind of sucks everyone in. So Bitcoin, I think, is is another investment that is in the process of achieving network effects. I think it maybe has already gotten there, but it just becomes so big that it it kind of sucks everyone in. And and I'm I'm constantly on the look for technology companies or or you know, projects in the digital asset space that are achieving these network effects where they're onboarding users at an exponential pace. Um, because if, if you have, if you can build a community that kind of creates a competitive moat around your, your idea. Um, and, and this competitive moat is really just your, your, your users. So, um, and, and in the case of Bitcoin, it could also be um, participants like miners and node operators. But Bitcoin is just a network. Um, the power of Facebook is really just a network. It's really just, um, you know, it's about finding projects that are kind of hitting that S curve, hitting the, the exponential phase of an S curve of adoption um, and, and trying to get out in front of those. On that note, what would you say is an important thing within a particular business outside of what you just described 
in order to take an investment more seriously? Um, I think, good question. Uh, whatever product a, a company is offering, um, I, I, I think what, what has become a really, and again, this is, this is more aimed towards, um, you know, because the world is moving more digital products that are really easy to use. Um, they're really simple and kind of extract away the, the complicated technology that may be, um, implemented. For example, like Venmo um, is in the cash app are just very, very simple apps. You just, you kind of, you, you log on, there's only really one thing you can do. Um, you send money to someone, you type in their name, you click on it, you type in how much money you want to send them and you send it. Um, and, and those apps, um, they've, they've gotten a lot of adoption because of that, I think. Robinhood, you know, as another example, is just, it's the same same type of thing as TD Ameritrade, but I think it's just way more simple. It's just an app. It's you got to buy and a sell button, um, and I think people like that. People like products that are really easy to use, very simple, uh, and so that's that's probably something that I look at um, when I'm when I'm looking more on the technology front. Um, if that if that answered your question, no, it certainly does. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the conversation being known as the Bitcoin go-to. Could you talk a little bit about that and uh, perhaps uh, some current perspectives you might have? Yeah, um, you know this. This is a uh, like I like I you know I said this is a it's a really steep learning curve uh, to get into Bitcoin and understanding how the blockchain works. Um, and because of that, it, I think a lot of people are intimidated to really dig in and, and figure it out. And so there's just not a whole lot of people who can speak intelligently about it. And, and so everyone just kind of tends to gravi gravitate towards uh, the people in their network who um, work in that industry like I do or, or know about it. Um, so... Yeah, I, I mean, people people ask me, I pay attention to a lot of the types of questions people ask because I it's kind of an indicator of where we're at in the market cycle. Um, people weren't interested in, in asking any questions about Bitcoin in 2018. Um, and even in 2019, even though, you know, Bitcoin had a phenomenal year um, compared to other, you know, investment asset classes, people still weren't really interested in it. Uh, 2020 not even really until Q3, Q4. And then all of a sudden I'm, I'm fielding, you know, I'm getting texts, I'm getting messages on LinkedIn. People are asking me about this, that, and, and, you know, even more recently now, more people are even messaging me about things like Dogecoin. Um, and so it, it's, it's interesting to watch people, you know, it, it's definitely a hype cycle uh, and people tend to, um, not really be interested in it until kind of everyone is all at once. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I try to break things down, uh, for people in, in as simple terms as possible. Um, I, I try to, I try to give, um, analogies or, or examples or just show them what the problems are that Bitcoin and other digital assets are solving. Uh, and so I've actually, I spent a lot of time talking about this um, with our investors, but, but there really is, there's a problem with our money on a very basic level. Um, and the problem with our money is that we don't have one monetary asset that can effectively uh, transfer value across both space and time. And I'll kind of break that down and what, what I mean by each of those. Um, so what do I mean about transferring value across space? Well, you know, how can I send money from here to anywhere in the world safely and securely um, and quickly? So, you know, for example, um, if you wanted to send a, you know, US dollar wire across, you know, um, across the border, you got to go through Western Union, you're going to, you're going to pay incredible fees. The wire is going to take probably weeks, and then it arrives and someone has to have a bank account in that country 
and they have to go take it out in that currency. And so by the time that money gets there, it's been weeks, you've paid incredible fees. Um, and it's just a really inefficient system. But now, you know, with Bitcoin, I can send money anywhere in the world and it, and it um, can achieve final settlement in minutes. And to access it, you only need a connection to the internet. So that's, a, that's just a, a massive improvement on how to send value across space. And at the same time, Bitcoin is able to transfer value across time. And what I mean by that is, is Bitcoin can, um, because Bitcoin has a cap supply, it, it is a scarce asset. And so in dollar terms, you know, if, if the dollar is on a secular downtrend, I guess Bitcoin will always be on a secular uptrend. Um, because it is, it's priced in dollars. And so Bitcoin's monetary policy is deflationary. And so um, people are, people will consider it a store of value um, that can sort of preserve your purchasing power across time. And so to have a money that you can both send anywhere in the world and get, you know, immediate settlement and hold um, sort of as a savings technology that's, that's built to um, be deflationary. That's that's groundbreaking, uh, and that solves a problem with money that we've had for a long time. You know, gold has been the best store of value historically, but you can't pay for things with gold. You can't send gold across the across the globe. It's really expensive to to do that. It's really expensive to store it, um, even though it, it has done a, a good job over um, over history of retaining its value. And the dollar, you can more easily send the dollar than gold. But again, the, the dollar doesn't retain its value over time. So you, it's this weird monetary system where you have to just continually be jumping between something that can preserve its value over time and then something that you can send to buy things with. Uh, and, and I think Bitcoin is a, an improvement on both of those fronts. Um, and so that's, that's really what I try to explain to people. Um, I try to encourage them to, to give it a try, you know, um, go, go and send a wire somewhere and, and, and you can see how, how onerous that is and, uh, and how much easier it is to send Bitcoin. And, and it's very, very similar to Venmo, but it's very different in a very um, substantial way. And, and that's really the ledger and the way that Bitcoin is uh, decentralized and, and that plays into the security of the network. So. Very much appreciate that insight you shared. Um, very much appreciate that insight you shared. Uh, with that in mind, uh, perhaps you can uh, answer this question. What's some of the best advice that you've received? It seems like you give a lot of advice to others, but what's some of the best advice that you've received? Um. That's a question. I would say uh, some of the some of the really good advice that I've received that I, I try to pass on to others is is when it comes to investments, protect your protect your 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 downside, um, and don't be afraid to take you know take your original capital off the table. Um, you know, you, you don't, you don't want to get wiped out on one investment, one trade. Uh, and so when you have the opportunity, when you make an investment and it does really well, and you have the opportunity to take your original invested capital off the table, um, it's, it's just, it's prudent to do that. Um, and, and to avoid the greed of, of, you know, I need to keep it all in. I'm going to ride it. I'm going to ride it all, you know kind of a hundred or zero type thinking and instead thinking in terms of, um, you know, protecting your downside. What's the worst case scenario here? Okay. You know, with something like Bitcoin or, or digital assets, you could lose all your money. That's definitely, you know, maybe it's not the downside. Maybe the, the floor is being raised a little bit, but, um, you know, historically that is the downside. And um, so, so protect, protect against that downside. Um, you know, no one, no one ever went broke taking profits. Uh, that's, that's 
what a lot of really wealthy investors have told me when it comes to investing is um, it's kind of that, that Warren Buffett be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy, but really just practically um, when you can take off your initial uh, capital investment, that's just a really smart thing to do. Cause then you're, you're essentially, um, you know, riding on house money. And so that's, that's something that I've been trying to put into practice. That's a piece of advice that I've found really helpful. Um, um, yeah, I would say that's probably the most helpful thing I've, I've learned. Great. Well, it's certainly been great speaking with you today and hearing a bit of your insights. Here's a bit of a changing question you could go back into history at any point in time as the best friend of anybody who would it be and what would you do go back in history and be anyone's best friend is that what you're asking that's right and i mean that's a that's a really good question um Well, as a as a um, uh, devout Christian, I guess I guess one one easy answer would be um, to to go back into Bible times and and be one of the close friends of Jesus and and watch him do ministry on earth. Um, I, I think that would be fascinating. And my second answer to to that question, I think, it would be an incredible time to be George Washington's uh, best friend and and. Um, walk through the revolutionary war by him and, and and i mean i think that'd be fascinating so those are those are kind of my two answers there definitely well once again thanks so much for your time looking forward to having you back on but until then perhaps you can share a final parting thought and a great way for people to keep up with uh, you and your team at pure crypto yeah um my final thought, I guess, would be uh, if people want a, a really good, succinct and articulate resource on, on trying to understand what Bitcoin is, I would I would highly suggest um, either the book Layered Money um, by Nick Batia. It's 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 a really short read. It's and it's really good. Or the Bitcoin Standard by uh, Safety and a Moose. Um, I, both of those books are excellent. They're, they're break things down much better than I ever could. Um, and so those are two really good resources if people are interested in learning about Bitcoin, uh, why it matters, why it's, why it, you know, I think it's going to change the world. Um, and people can follow me on LinkedIn. That's probably where I'm most active. I really am on Twitter just to um, read. I don't, I don't really post anything on Twitter, but LinkedIn I do. Um, so people can follow me there, Zach Lindquist. Um, I don't know if I even have a LinkedIn handle, but that's, that's how you can find me and keep up with uh, what I'm doing and what we're doing here at Pure Crypto. Fantastic. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. Yep. Thank you. Thanks for attending the business podcast and stay tuned for more episodes.